When I was in third grade, there was this girl in my class. She wasn't particularly liked by anyone, as she was quite the bully and overall a rude person, even to adults. She was known to have anger issues and get mad at people for what seemed like no reason. I was no exception. Her name was Carly. She'd been mean to me in the past, but that didn't deter me from going to her house one day after she'd been nice to me all day at school. Naive, I know. So, before leaving school that day, I called my mom to ask if I was allowed to go to Carly's house. She said yes and to call her when I get there so I can give her the address. Now when I think back, I wonder if she had a bad feeling about the situation since she doesn't normally ask for the address and she wasn't picking me up since Carly's house was about two blocks away. When I got there, after calling my mom of course, Carly insisted on making me look pretty, aka wetting my hair and brushing it. I let her. Then she told me to close my eyes and that she was taking me to the living room. I closed my eyes and she began to guide me towards the bathtub. We were already in the bathroom, so the tub was a solid two feet away from where we were standing. I opened my eyes just enough to see where she was guiding me. My foot hit the side of the tub and I said that this didn't feel like the living room. She said that it was and that I just need to step over the gate. I tell her that I know this is the bathtub. She stops trying to get me into the tub and brings me to the kitchen instead. She says she's going to make cereal. I was standing behind her when she reached into her dishwasher and said she was grabbing a spoon. The way that she clarified that she was grabbing a spoon immediately told me what she was really going to grab. And it was for sure not a spoon. I can still remember the feeling of dread that overcame me when she said those words. She pulls out a large knife and backs me up into a corner, holding the knife only inches away from my neck. I can't remember if any words were exchanged during this. Maybe I was just too shocked to say anything. I only stayed there for maybe 30 seconds before I pushed her aside and ran towards the door. I grabbed my backpack and put on my winter boots. By the time I had my boots on, Carly was trying to block the sliding door. I pushed past her again and flung open the door. I ran down her patio steps and out her front gate, not bothering to close it. I just wanted to get home to where I was safe. I remember her yelling at me as her dogs escaped through the open gate. I didn't care. One of her neighbors who was in their front lawn waved and smiled at me, clearly oblivious to what had just gone down. I ran down the road into my house, not stopping once. It wasn't until I was in the door of my house that I broke down. I began to cry and yell for my mom, my two older sisters yelling at me to shut up. My mom walked over to me and immediately knew there was something wrong. I explained what happened and she was very understanding and freaked out. I can't remember if it was the same day or the next day that I had to talk to a police officer about what happened. He asked me what kind of knife it was and what not. I think my mom relayed most of the story to him because I don't remember having to say much. They got in contact with Carly's foster mom and Carly got in big shit for it. At school, Carly yelled at me for getting the cops involved and tried to guilt trip me by saying that her mom threatened to put her back into foster care if she did anything like that again. I told her I didn't care. The school was also notified about the situation and the teachers made sure to keep an extra eye on her, but that didn't mean I wasn't paranoid around her. I made sure to keep my guard up for the rest of the school year, which was true. She had it coming. I always thought that it was a bit extreme to involve the cops, but I ended up making Carly never mess with me again. I ended up moving after that year for unrelated reasons, only to move back before I started sixth grade. The first day of middle school, I was waiting for them to call my name so I know which class is my home room. 
when I hear an all too familiar name, Carly. I watch as no one goes up to join the class. Was she not here? Next, I was called. I go up to join the class that she would have been in. I found out later, when the teacher was doing attendance, that she'd moved three hours away just before the beginning of the school year. It's been years since then, and I can only hope I don't see her again. But if I do, I'm not too concerned. And if she does make an appearance, I will make sure that she stays away from me. That incident has given me some trust issues, but at least now I know how to choose my friends wisely. For some context, I live in a major city and currently don't do a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car, and the pandemic has made me turn to more delivery apps in general. So the other day, around 1pm, I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. Within a few minutes, a driver accepted the order and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike, didn't have a profile picture, or any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't alarmed at all. I was almost amused, like, oh wow, guess I'm this person's first ever customer. But then a full 30 minutes passes, with no driver movement on the app, and at this point, I'm thinking maybe something is glitching out, or the driver is stuck. I contact support via the chat option, and they end up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. Odd, but whatever. Now is when it starts getting a little weirder. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver was. They're also on a bike, also have no profile picture, and have no prior deliveries as well. And this driver's name was... Laurie. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movement before I message them myself and say, Hi there, are there any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but there was no response. All this time, I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing some issues, and at this point, while I'm definitely weirded out, I'm mostly just hungry, so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, no prior deliveries. Only this time the name is Robert. And before I can react and go about canceling the order at this point because I'm tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messages me the following. Hello, have your food. What's your phone number? I responded right away with, I'm not really comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded with, What's your number? Be there in ten. How old are you? And at this point the alarm bells are going off. I contact support immediately to have the order cancelled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team, who informs me that the order has been cancelled. I'll be refunded. They start taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the information she needs, I'm starting to calm down, thinking this was just some creep or something. And that's when I hear a man's voice at the door. Miss Joanna, I have your food. And I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way he said it. Making things even worse, the uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him as well and says, Is that him? We cancelled the order. I poked my head around the door. The main heavy door was open. The metal screen door was closed and locked, but it did allow us to see each other. I got a look at him, and when he saw me on the phone, 
he went from smiling to looking furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with. And at this point, I started asking him to leave because he was making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry. He starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay. The man is still shouting. So basically, I'm in full meltdown mode at this point and hurriedly close the heavy door to lock it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute after that and back up to the sidewalk. And for a moment, I thought he fucked off. So I finished my conversation with the Uber safety woman so she could submit the report. Once she submitted it, I called the police and told them what happened. They told me if he came back to call again and they would send out an officer. I did end up having to call them again and give a full report and description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat, and they apparently just sat there staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle, and the other man as well. So basically, there was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience, and I wanted to share it to maybe see if anyone has ever experienced anything like this. Because honestly, I'm still pretty shaken up, and I will be avoiding delivery apps for quite a while. So, strange Uber Eats driver who asked me for personal information and then proceeded to try and break in. Please, let's not meet. My wife and I purchased our house about six years ago and decided to start a family. I love our neighborhood and our neighbors and especially love to go out for long walks at night. One neighbor is a single mom and has three kids. I never really thought much about it though. I often would remark to my wife about how awesome it was that she could afford such a nice house and always seemed to be around. It became apparent one day, though, that something was wrong. We started seeing different things sprinkled around her house. Fake plastic flowers tied to her mailbox, dressed up with ribbons and a doll head. Just creepy stuff. After a quick powwow with my neighbors, we found out that she had a history of mental disorders, and they all feared that she'd stopped taking her medication. Over the period of a couple weeks, she began acting more and more erratic. She would peel out of her driveway in her car, race up and down the street, wander around, and would come up to various neighbors and give them a random present. Things like a rock, a shiny stone, plastic toy, or something like that. One evening, I go out on one of my regular walks, and I can instantly tell something is up. Her car is parked sideways on her driveway, Every exterior and interior light was on in and around her house, and she was pacing back and forth in her yard. I crossed the street and hid in some shadows and just decided to observe her. I have training in human development, and I'm a generalist in knowledge around emotional and behavioral disorders. Suddenly, I saw her sprint across the street to my side of the street and jump on my neighbor's porch right in front of the door and just stood there. She stood there for a good ten minutes and then, very slowly, turned around and started to walk back across the street. I thought about calling the police, but she was technically not doing anything wrong. So I started walking across the street to intercept her. I did not startle her and said loudly, Hi Chrissy, how are you? Now, I don't have any direct experience working with people during breakdowns, 
and after seeing her eyes and behavior, have no desire ever to. She immediately was friendly and said hi, asked about my pregnant wife, and that was when I noticed that she had two open lock knives in each hand. Now I was creeped out, but still did not feel like I was in danger. I was really more worried that she was a danger to herself. I continued talking, and she suddenly says, I really need your help. I can't get my DVD player to work. Can you fix it for me? My curiosity was out of control at this point, and I am much larger than her. I entered her house and literally walked into a nightmare. The place was trashed. There were garbage bags and dirt on the floor. All of her possessions were stacked up in various areas of the living room and kitchen. There were broken light fixtures. The kitchen sink was filled with dishes and rotting food. Suddenly she went full on with manic behavior, started explaining how the different piles were different cities, and then became completely nonsensical in her speech. She was using English words, but completely out of context, and then would look for me for a reaction. Honestly, I should not have been there, but I just finished up two years of studying human development, including schizophrenia, which is definitely what she was. It was just so utterly fascinating to me, and even though she still had two knives, I never felt threatened by her. In fact, the opposite. She was so glad to have some company. I started to quickly scan her house looking for weapons, drugs, or anything else she could harm herself with. She led me upstairs, which was completely trashed as well. She was using small potted plants with plants half dead in them as ashtrays. Her clothes were everywhere. I went into her master bedroom and honestly did try to set up the DVD player while she randomly walked around the house talking. Even though the TV was like mine, I just couldn't get the TV to recognize the DVD player for some reason and I was starting to get nervous. During this time, I noticed that she had a set of knives down and I quickly folded them up and pocketed them. I apologized to her that I couldn't get the DVD player to work and then asked her if she thought it was time for her to take her medication. She assured me that she already had and asked me if I had a joint. I told her no. I scanned the upstairs and saw no more knives or weapons, and it was sad. You could tell that her kids had left in a hurry. Their rooms were trashed and they had left their Nintendo DSs behind. Not seeing any more weapons, I went back downstairs to double check the kitchen, but she was watching me now, and I didn't want to be obvious. I apologized for not being able to help her, but thought it was time we both went to bed, and that she might want to stay inside now. She agreed with me. I left, and when I finally went outside, realized that I had just walked into her madness, and even felt a little strange afterwards, and it had just been too bizarre. The next day was Mother's Day, I found out later that her husband's parents had taken her kids away from her a week before that, due to her erratic behavior. With Mother's Day approaching, she just lost it even more. Eventually she went away and came back about a month later, and she was back to her normal self. Friendly, but subdued. I still live down the street from her, and I say hi to her, but it's the saddest thing to see. You can tell she's on her medication and regulated, but she has no emotion, no personality. She's lost her husband and her children to her disease, but the big unknown is where she gets her money. She used to be a corporate buyer for a large corporation, buying lots of goods all over the country. She had another episode about a year ago, and I found out that I'm now her reach out to person during them. I was working in my yard and she came up to me raving mad that they would not put a stop sign on my street and started swearing and ranting and then gave me a glass stone that she told me would protect me and my beautiful family. She's back to being fine now, but I know what signs to look for around her house. I still have the glass stone and I keep it on a ledge I can see when I walk down the stairs in my house. To me, it serves as a reminder of how truly lucky I am with what I have and how bad life can be for those afflicted with mental illness. 
I also found out her teenage son was killed while out skateboarding at night. She went off her medication, as if the tragedy could not get any worse. She came over to see me and broke down crying in my arms. This is such a tragedy. I'm glad I can at least be there for her. Really not the way I wanted to spend my Saturday morning, but sadly here we are. I'm writing this as I sit down, more scared and anxious than I ever have been, beyond belief. I'm a female who was at my friend's flat. We were with her sister and also another female friend. Lots of good vibes and laughs. Just normal girly time. At some point, uh, a trusted nice guy and a bit of a simp, but someone we wouldn't feel uncomfortable around, arrived. Women know what I mean especially about the nice best friend to girl guy. Anyway, he was very approachable at first, very polite and sweet, but I was always told never to trust anyone who is nice on first appearance. It's usually overcompensation for something, or to hide something evidently darker, as I found out later on. He slowly became more argumentative and had a very patronizing, condescending tone which would rise for no reason. He acted like he was being completely normal, despite being passive-aggressive. It was a quick turn. Moving on, he attempted to take my water bottle and insisted to everyone for no reason when I took it back out of his pocket. Which is weird anyway. Who put someone else's Evian bottle in their pocket? He then insisted it was his, and that he brought it with him, and genuinely seemed to believe it was his. This was when I got a weird gut feeling something was just not quite right. We then proceeded to have a back and forth, nothing harsh said, but I told him he thinks he's the smartest person in the room, and I could see right through him. Quite an assumption to make about someone, but as a human we can sense danger. Then, to top this already slightly alarming experience, he started pulling very vulgar sex faces and hand motions, not even in a jokey way between friends. He did it every time he got the chance. He was pretending to do some weird sex motion. Needless to say, I was very disgusted, as I barely even knew him, and it wasn't in a badger type way where it was laughed off as a little one-off, but he repeatedly did it. He did this to me as no one was looking, and stood slightly behind my friend who was talking, so he could make these ugly gestures to me. He kept asking me to come back to his, and told me he wants to take me abroad, as he needs someone to look after him when drunk. I told him I'm not a babysitter in a bit of a joke way, and he straight away went very stiff and defensive. Slightest things seemed to trigger him. After being in a high alert, abusive situation for many years, sadly you recognize even more so that something in the air just isn't right. Even if you're not 100% of your gut feeling, always follow it, because it's there for a reason. There's absolutely no need for taking chances. Sadly, this world is too unkind. Anyway, my friend had gone to bed, my friend's sister was getting ready to leave, but I was very reluctant to be left alone with him for obvious reasons. She ordered a taxi and asked him to walk her out to it. He agreed, and I told him very bluntly I'm locking him out, and his immediate response in a very nonchalant manner was, Yeah, I would. That for some reason was what made me double down wholeheartedly on making sure I locked him out. Despite my friends maybe getting upset, I've locked another friend out. I wasn't too concerned about what they would say, as I knew in my heart this man had ill intentions. I got the vibe he was pre-warning me, a bit like an animal playing with his food before eating. He was enjoying being weird and making me uncomfortable. As he walked out the door with my friend, I immediately locked the door. And thank you, God and Jesus above, that I locked the door, as usually I would forget. But in this instance, I am forever grateful I turned the lock. 
Thinking I was free of this weird creep, I heard talking at the door and someone trying to slightly push it open. I told him I was feeling scared and don't feel comfortable at all in his presence. I called him a weirdo and a creep and his response was, I'm not that weird. But he said it in an inquisitive way, like he was trying to convince himself and not at any point did he take offense to my dramatic accusations and labels. I told him he had suppressed sexual urges and that he won't be taking them out on me. He then proceeded to say, Oh, but not in a cute way. It was in a very apathetic, weird tone. Even in these interactions, I was panicking more, because instead of just thinking he was a run-around normal creep, I was digging into something much weirder and darker. He proceeded to attempt to open the door again, begging just to talk to me for two minutes, and weirdly enough, I couldn't make out if it was actually him through the door, as I had bad eyes, but I knew it was him, obviously due to the conversation we had. He stood outside for 15 minutes, pretending to book a taxi, and he kept repeating that our mutual friend was gone. He then left, and I was on high alert. I was standing by the door, and out of nowhere, I saw a white guy. The original guy was not white so I noticed it wasn't the same person. He walked straight over to the door and covered the peephole with his thumb. This made my heart literally quiver. I was genuinely scared for my safety in a way that was very unsettling, and I hope no one else feels that fear. But those that know, your heart just sinks in this horrible way. The door was the only thing separating me from this utter evil predator. What made it so weird is that he was attempting to get a friend to come round and that we should all go out to the town. It's weird as no one was dressed for such outings. But looking back, that second guy who came to the door ever so randomly and covered the peephole looked like he left something on the floor. But I'm obviously not going outside to check as I panicked so bad I don't remember if I saw him leave the little hallway or communal entrance but I'm not sure if he did. I woke my friend to tell her. She could see I was so scared. I told her what happened, and she said she's never had anything like this happen, and how she doesn't know an older white guy, saying that she's a 24-year-old Jamaican woman and just doesn't happen to know any middle-aged white guys. It wouldn't have been so scary, but the way he just came right to the door and immediately covered the peephole, it was like he knew someone would be looking through there. I believe maybe this was connected, because what are the odds of this happening so close to each other in about a 10 minute difference and not have some form of connection? Either way, please remember to lock your doors. It saves lives as simple as it is. If that door had opened when he attempted due to being unlocked, who knows what I would have endured. I've never had anything this creepy happen, and I live in a big city, and I have a slightly unconventional lifestyle, so I have seen it all. People are very dangerous. Please be aware, if you feel something isn't right, it's not. A buddy of mine had just bought a camera and liked playing around with the exposure open. So we took a couple of colored plastic cups and went out to a part of the woods where we knew there was a trail we could walk down. It was close to midnight because we wanted it to be dark out to be able to see the effect of the light. Me and my friend held the cups over our heads and used the flashlights on our phones to light up the cups. I had a phone that I had to start recording to be able to use the flashlight, and so I did. The plan was to start at the top of a hill and walk down the trail towards the camera to create sort of a string of light. As we started to walk down the hill, me and my buddy started chatting, but quickly noticed his eyes were wide open, looking at me as if a werewolf had emerged right behind me. Naturally, I said, what? 
getting really scared immediately as well as we got totally quiet. He says in a high-pitched, whisper-screaming type of voice, You don't see that? And then I heard it. The sound of laughter from kids not older than six years old. Both of us panicked and started running down the hill, and we got to our friend with the camera way too early, and he says, What the hell are you doing? You have to walk slowly towards the camera or you'll ruin the shot. We told him that we heard kids laughing in the woods, and he didn't believe us, naturally. But I realized I had the camera running. So maybe it caught something, and I played it back to him. The microphone picked it up perfectly. Two or possibly three kids, around six years old or so, in the middle of the woods. No house or guardian or light in sight. Needless to say, we note right out of there. So while I was attending cosmetology school, I worked at Applebee's trying to support myself. Emphasis on try. I went to both every day, which resulted in 18-hour work days. I didn't mind it this time because I was in an abusive relationship and didn't really want to be at home. However, I was still very tired at the end of the day, considering I worked from 8 in the morning until 3 in the morning. Well... I was closing one night, and one of the closing duties at the bees was to clean the bathrooms. I'm a female, and it wasn't uncommon for men to come into the bathroom while I was cleaning it. Usually they would wait for me to leave so they could do what they needed to. This night was different. As I was cleaning, a guy walks in. I look up and see it's one of the cooks. Usually the cooks were friendly, so I just said, Hey Shannon. Let me get out of your hair. Without saying a word, Shannon proceeds to push me into a stall. He locks the door. He pins me against the wall and just stares into my eyes for what seems like an eternity with an angry look on his face. The entire time, I'm absolutely freaking out and beg him to let me out. He says nothing at all and just keeps staring at me. After what was probably only about a minute, but felt like an hour. He moved out of the way. I unlocked the stall door and ran to the safety of the front of the house. I immediately clocked out and left. I didn't tell my managers I was leaving or what had happened. I quit about a month later. I haven't seen Shannon since I quit, but Lord knows I'll murder him if I see him again. Fuck you, Shannon. Once, I was working in a restaurant and got done around 12-ish. I always rode my bicycle to and from work. It was about 15 minutes along a bike trail next to the train tracks. This trail was constantly straight, but had a few exits here and there. It also only had a few small parts of it lit up by street lights. So without my front bicycle light, I would be totally blind for the most part. So... This one night, I leave on my own home after the shift, and I notice a guy is biking behind me, which isn't too weird at that time of night, in a busy city. It was weird that he had no lights, and was still there after the first main exits, which after that led to a small town, but I thought it might just be a coincidence. I began to feel a bit creeped out, and thought I might just be tired, and the darker the night is getting to me. So, I decided to bike a bit slower and let this person pass. There was definitely enough room on this trail. The person started drifting along at the same speed as me and made no attempt to pass or even come closer. This is about when I'm a few minutes away from home and decide to take some random lefts and rights instead of going straight home, just in case this person was following me. I wouldn't find out where I live. I bike around, going in random twists and turns in a suburban neighborhood, and he's still behind me. 
What I then did, as I noticed I was heading straight for a long, small, dark path, only for bicycles, I decided to turn into one of the houses and hide in the dark shadows from their garage. I heard this person pass the house and break quickly in that small path. At this moment, my blood is boiling. Now I hop on my bike, and when I pass the edge of that street, I stop and stared that person in the eyes. I biked so fast then, I did another few extra loops here and there until I felt safe and alone again to go home. I've never had anything like it afterwards, and I still don't know who or why it could have been, but I'm happy not knowing. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., so I always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was a weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs and coming out from our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock, and it was around 2.30 a.m., and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Of course, now this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked down... There was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys who'd been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been... They would have easily seen me coming down the stairs, as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, we see the men return and they begin knocking again despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog is still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards, and still knocking while the dog was barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walk away, and we all shuffle across the kitchen into the family room to peek out of the windows into our driveway which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where did those guys go? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house, which enters the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying, David, as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point, two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police, and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door 
and disappeared again, only to return knocking at the front door. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by, and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased, and then proceeded to fall on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. This happened to me at my previous job. Howard was a senior in my team. One day during chit chat, he asked me to recommend some colognes to him, as I know a lot about perfumes and fragrances. I recommended some, and then he asked me to help him buy it. I suggested it's better to try it out in person before buying for colognes, but he insisted many times that I buy my recommendation for him. So I eventually did. After I bought it, I WhatsApp him with a receipt. He texted back, Thanks, I'll treat it as a gift from you. LOL. He did pay me back later, so I thought he was just making a joke. The manager of my previous team, Alfred, asked me to go grab a drink after work another day, as he noticed I was frustrated at work lately. He also said I could invite more people if I wanted, so I invited Kate my closest friend in the company, who also was in Alfred's team. Kate suggested to me that I invite one more colleague, as she believed it was better to hang out in a group of four. I think for a bit, and invite Howard, as he had worked under Alfred before. I told Howard that Alfred wanted to buy us all drinks. I have drinks with Kate and another colleague Aiden together regularly after work so that was the first time I hung out with either Alfred or Howard. After the drinks, we decided to take the last scheduled subway home. Only Howard and I live in the same direction. I knew he lived near a certain stop from previous chit-chat, and that's about ten stops before mine. I live quite far away from the subway station, so I planned on taking a taxi after getting off at my stop. After we got on the subway, Howard started saying things that made me uncomfortable. For instance, he asked when he could become as close to me as Aiden, or whether Aiden had ever been to my apartment. To be honest, I wasn't even that close with Aiden, and we were more like work friends. I was annoyed by all those questions, but I thought to myself, it's just a few more stops until his. I'd have my peace soon. Howard didn't get off at his stop. I asked him about it, to which he replied he had some errands near the stop before mine the next morning, so he'd be staying at a friend's near that stop. Luckily Howard shut up soon, probably because of my lack of response, so I just looked at my phone in silence. I just noticed Howard was still there when I was about to get off at my stop. He followed me off the subway and ordered to take a taxi together. He said he'd drop me off at my place and then go to his friend's place, which would make no sense as these two drop-off points were in completely different directions, so I declined by saying I planned to walk home. Then he offered to walk me. I said it's an hour away, and persuaded him to get a taxi outside of my subway stop. He finally budged and called a taxi through the app, which shows the estimated fare. I overheard him murmuring the amount which was definitely more than traveling from my stop to his friend's stop. It was more like traveling to his first stop. I suspected the stay at his friend's thing was a lie all along, just to follow me home. 
A week later, Kate told me she overheard Howard insinuate to Alfred that we were in a relationship. I was creeped out by Howard, but didn't bring it up to Alfred, as he didn't ask me about it either. A month later, Alfred invited his team and a lot of people he previously worked with to dinner to celebrate the end of a project. After the meal, Alfred asked me where I was headed to as he knew I had two apartments. Kate and Howard were walking with us. I told Alfred I'm going back to the apartment in the same direction of Kate's. Howard joined the conversation and said he's going that direction too as a friend was hosting a party there. Kate and I were doubtful. On the subway, Kate asked him where the party was, and Howard replied with the same stop as mine. So Kate and I pretended we had other places to hang out, and I was not getting off at that stop. Eventually the stop came and Howard got off. I rode with Kate to her stop, and then got on another subway back at my stop. I avoided him as much as possible before I could quit my job since then. For starters, my parents have always taught me how to be independent. I live 30-ish minutes away from New York City by train, so I was taught not to be afraid of the subway systems. I quickly learned how to find my way around New York City and my town in Jersey via public transportation and was always checking in with my parents whether I was going to practice or a movie with my friends, so it was never a big deal. Anyway, a few weeks prior to the incident, the internet in our house wasn't working, and I needed the computer to finish some research paper. Since the library was closed, my brother took me to this internet cafe a few blocks away from our house. While there, my brother was talking to his friend Charles, and introduced us both. Little did I know, this Charles was about to save my life. Oh, I almost forgot an important detail. This cafe was on the main street of my town, and there was a bus stop a block away from the cafe. A few weekends after meeting Charles, my friends invited me to go bowling in the city. My parents said okay. I was 14, so obviously I had to ask for permission, and I was on my way around noon. We bowled, got pizza, talked about my friend's new puppy. Typical girl things. Everything was fine until I was making my way back home. 3 p.m. There are delays with the subway system. Instead of waiting it out, I decided I could just take another subway home. It would drop me off at the Newark Penn Station, and I would be one bus ride away from home. No problem. 3.15 p.m. I'm on the subway, and I notice that this older man is staring at me. It creeps me out, but it's nothing new in New York City. I ignore him. 3.50 p.m. I arrived at Newark Penn Station, and this man sees me get up to go. He makes eye contact, smiles. He hurries behind me. Mind you, I'm a young, small girl at the time, so I'm an easy target. He's creepy, so I decided to walk fast and get lost in the crowds. Doors open. I speed walk through people. This guy must have had 20-20 vision because as soon as I arrived at my bus stop, he was right behind me. Around 4pm-ish, I'm sitting next to an elderly looking lady at the bus stop. The creepy guy is pacing back and forth less than 10 feet away from me. He's looking at me, smiling, pacing the floor. Every part of my young body is saying, run, now, he's bad news, but there's nowhere to go, and somehow sitting next to this older lady made me feel safer. I take my phone out to text my mom. It's dead. Wonderful. Thankfully, more people have arrived at this bus stop, and I feel better. There are witnesses around. He can't do anything, but he's still staring and pacing back and forth. 4.15 p.m. The bus arrives, finally. I quickly get in and sit as close as possible to the driver. I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver what was happening. I was young, scared, naive, and didn't want to burden the driver. 
Stupid, I know now. My stop is the very last one, so I thought. The creepy guy has to get off the bus before me. There's no way he's going to stay until the end. Many, many bus stops later, this guy is still on the bus. He did this creepy thing. Whenever the bus stopped, he would get up with everyone else. And instead of getting off the bus, he would sit closer and closer to the front. There are fewer and fewer people on the bus, so I realize this guy is getting off whenever I get off the bus. This means, if I get off at my stop, he can follow me home, find out where I live, or maybe I'll never get home. 5pm-ish, there were only two bus stops separating me and my house. This guy, a lady and I, are the last ones inside the bus at this point. I decide I'm getting off early because I'm not having this guy know where I live. I get off a bus stop early. He sees me and follows me. I pick up speed. He picks up speed. Fuck it. I run. And now he's running after me. In mid-panic, I remember the cafe. It closes soon. I'm a block away. I run for my life to the cafe and this guy is right behind me. As I'm approaching the cafe, I see Charles outside, locking up the place. He sees me and knows there's something wrong. I guess he sees the fear in my face, and this older guy running after young me. I get to him, and Charles immediately pushes me inside the cafe and locks the door behind us, therefore locking the creep outside. My heart is pounding. I quickly tell Charles that this random guy's been following me across three towns and that I was scared. He calls the cops. The guy is staring inside the cafe, and I'm staring back at him, protected by the locked, yet clear glass door. I had to remember him. The creepy guy smiles and walks away as if nothing had just happened. Little did I know that Charles' uncle is a cop in our town. A few minutes later, the cops show up. After describing him in vivid details, it takes them minutes to catch this creep still walking down the main street. We later find out that this creepy guy had a warrant out for his arrest for armed robbery, and he had prior accounts of sexual assault. Had it not been for Charles, I don't know what would have happened to me that day. Thanks for saving my life. And no, this did not deter me from public transportation or from exploring the city alone. My parents did freak out and got me mace though. As an adult, I traveled all over the world, sometimes alone. But I'm hyper aware of my surroundings because of what happened at 14. I don't even know how to begin this. To be honest, I was only able to piece together what happened a few months ago. I guess I'll start from where I believe the beginning is, but I can't assure you it was the first time I saw him. At the time, I lived in a European city, very central and cosmopolitan. When I was about 15 years old, I was extremely interested in philosophy books. I didn't feel I could talk to my friends about the subject without boring them. So when this man approached me on the street with a pamphlet about Plato classes, I was pretty excited. He was about 28 to 30 years old, very tall, skinny, and crazy eyes. I remember I was a smartass and thought that reading two of his most well-known books made me interesting. So we started debating. It was a nice conversation and it lasted about 10 minutes, but it was getting late so I left it at that. He told me his name, but I honestly cannot remember it. A couple of days after, I found him on the same street at a totally different time. It was always very crowded, so I wasn't especially spooked about it. I was getting out of the subway after classes. Mind you, I took this route every day until I graduated high school. I didn't live on that street, but that's where I got out of the subway and then waited for the bus that would get me home. 
This time he didn't have any pamphlets. He had a lollipop in his hand. And I know it sounds cliche, but it was so eerie to see a six-foot guy just sucking his lollipop and staring straight at me. He said hi. I said hi back. He tried to get the conversation going, but I could feel this weird energy in the air, so I just decided to cut the conversation short. I'd see him once or twice a week, and I just assumed he lived there and happened to be going for a walk at the same time I was getting home. I honestly believe this weird guy, twice my age, just happened to find his way to me so many times. That is until I saw him in my neighborhood. I was having a coffee with a friend, and she was telling me that she met this cool guy while playing volleyball on the beach, when the guy, I shit you not, just appeared out of nowhere. He approached my friend and they talked for a bit. Yes, he was the guy she was talking about. He seemed mildly surprised that we were friends, but didn't give it much thought. So I didn't either. When he left, I started feeling uneasy, but my friend thought he was cool, so I didn't voice my concerns. There's this thing about teenage girls that makes them think they're very mature for their age, so we just assumed he'd befriended us separately and then found out we were friends. At the time, none of us had social media, so I can't understand how he managed to insert himself into my friend group. Eventually, my friend left to study abroad, and the subject died. I would see the guy now and then, on the same street of my commute, but we would only speak for a few minutes, and that's it. This went on for about six months. Sometimes he would pretend he didn't know who I was, but would still approach me, saying that I looked familiar. Sometimes he would greet me very warmly. Looking back, I guess he was dealing with some kind of mental health problems. Slowly, he was getting bolder. One time he asked for my number and tried to hug me. I could feel that something was very wrong, but at the same time, I thought I was being the weird one and he was just a nice guy. Still, I gave him a fake number. This other time, we went to a church on a school trip, and he was waiting outside, talking to my peers. He played it cool, saying that he'd seen my face somewhere, but was not sure, as if I hadn't been seeing him almost every week for a year now. I was very stupid. I never thought about talking to my parents about this. After all, the guy was not violent. He was not me. In my head... He was just a lonely man who happened to have a strangely similar routine. I started to get scared though. I'd look behind my back when I was alone at night. I'd avoid dark streets. I was kind of paranoid, but still, I ignored my gut feeling and shoved it in the back of my mind. After all, as long as I gave him a few minutes of my day when he called out for me, everything would be fine. When I turned 17, I stopped seeing him. I think this went on for about a year. It was a relief, honestly. I could sense that what happened was bizarre, but I'd explain it to my friends like it was funny, like it was a joke. Eventually, I started attending college, so my everyday route changed. I stayed in the same city, though. One day, I had to go through the same street again. I can't remember why. I just know that I was walking minding my own business. It was maybe 9 p.m., and then I turned around the corner, and there he was. He saw me, smiled, and said he was lost. He asked for directions, and I swear to God, I felt primal fear at that moment. I felt I was dealing with a truly insane person because we'd crossed each other's paths for two years straight in this exact same spot and he was acting as if he didn't know me or the intersection. Something about that messed with my mind for a while. I just kept walking. I didn't look at him, didn't utter a single word, and then he lost his shit. For the first time, I saw what he really was. He tried to grab my arm and screamed that I was the biggest bitch ever. He said that he hoped my mom died of cancer. He said he would kill me. I know I wasn't alone as there were still quite a lot of people outside, but 
but no one said anything. He kept screaming his lungs out, and I just started running. I ran and cried. That was the last time I ever saw him. Two years ago. He has long since stopped talking to my friend. No one knows who he is. I can't remember a name to go to the police and file a report. It's like my mind has tried to erase him. He was a stellar stalker though because I only understood that's what he was years after the fact. I'm just grateful I'm safe. I used to live in a small town where everyone basically knew everyone and people in the smaller towns in the area. In 2018, after I'd lost my job, I was going to a place where people from 16 to 30 learned how to look and apply for a job, and a lot else. There I met a woman. Her name was Yivi. One day Yivi started to talk about a friend of hers who lived out of town with her mom, her dog, and her creepy German stepdad. Her friend told her that she desperately wants to move out because her stepdad makes her so uncomfortable. Her bedroom is right next to their bathroom, so she'd usually put on her new clothes in her bedroom, but now she does it in the bathroom because he'd look at her inappropriately when she walked to her bedroom. Her stepdad would get off the couch and try to spy on her while she was in the bedroom. I had a gut feeling that this wasn't the last I'd hear of him, and I'm sad to say that I was right. I broke up with my ex in 2019 but shortly after that, I got a job at a thrift store, taking care of jigsaw puzzles and board games. 2020 came along, and I became so lonely that I downloaded an app that was only aimed at finding friendship. I started talking to a guy in January who said that he was 27 years old, and that he was from Germany, and that he lived in the exact same town that Yivi said her friend did. I thought that was odd, but out of curiosity, I talked with him some more. He said that he moved to Sweden with his wife and their dog, and that's where red flags start to rise, but he's looking for someone to talk to because they're going through a divorce right now. He wanted to meet and perhaps go for a walk in the forest near his house. He talked about hobbies he had, like his motorcycle and other things I've forgotten about right now. My creep meter was pegging, and I ghosted him hard. Eight months later, when I was laying a jigsaw puzzle, I heard a man with a German accent come in. I felt something was off, but I continued to do my job. For obvious reasons, we didn't have a lot of people who worked there at that moment, but this made me the youngest woman there. My male boss was going to do something before he showed him the place. While my boss worked, this guy roamed around and then asked if he could sit down and talk to me. I said okay, because of course there could be more than one German person, even in a small community. Remember all the important things. Yes, he told me almost all of the same things again. It wasn't the age he said he was. He was old, if not older than my father, and he's now 53. The color disappeared from my face, and I started to scratch my neck in fear. He trauma dumped on me. He talked about how he slept with a young girl in Germany, got her pregnant, and was forced to leave because of this. Apparently she gave birth to his son, and his son reached out to him when he was older. His son had told him that he was gay, and that creep is now blaming himself for making his son gay. He talked about his dad's alcoholism and other things I can't remember. He also asked if we could eat together, but I declined. HR came into our working room and she called my name. I turned my head and she clearly saw that I was afraid. She said that she needed to talk to me. I only nodded, stood up, and walked over to her, still scratching my neck. We walked to another room where she sat me down on a sofa and asked me if I was okay. And all I could say was, I'm afraid of this man. And when I'd calmed down, I gave her the short version of what happened, and her eyes widened. It was close to closing time, so she asked if I wanted to go home, and she'd make sure that he'd leave ten minutes after I'd gone. 
I didn't even look at her once. I was so frozen in fear that I only stared at the wall while continuing to attack my neck. After a few minutes, I only nodded. She walked me to the employee's entrance and stood there while I walked home. I saw the damage I'd done to myself when I arrived home. My female boss wasn't there until Monday, and unfortunately, HR wasn't there that day. My boss came over to my desk and said that she'd spoken with HR, but she wanted to hear it from me. I told her exactly what had happened, and I also told her that I'd heard about him before. Her response was, and these are her exact words, but in English, I've heard of him before because I have an old friend who unfortunately is at a mental hospital right now. She told me that he's the kind of person who likes to attack young, thin, vulnerable, and insecure women. My fear turned into rage. I just looked at her and said, Are you crazy? You know what type of man he is. You knew that I'm working here, and you still hired him. She said that she talked with the male boss who also knew about him, and they decided that people can change. I said that I agree, but he's already shown that he's not willing to. She decided to make him work during the weekends, and forbade him to come to work during the week when I was there. Of course he showed up anyway. When HR was there, she'd tell him to go out, but when she wasn't, you could clearly tell that he was looking for another victim or for me. My bosses are lovely people, even though they're severely confused. I should have reported them, but it's too late now. I moved to a city that's more than two hours away, and he doesn't work there anymore. I live in a little suburban area on the outskirts of a city. My apartment is on the ground floor and faces into a cul-de-sac with a car park. Recently, I've been hearing a lot of cat-related kerfuffle from the area. I didn't think much of it at first. There are plenty of cats, pets, and strays in the area. They fight, they screw, all that stuff. I'm well used to the kinds of unearthly noises cats can make. They can be pretty freaky especially when you wake up in the darkest hours of pre-dawn to them. Anyway, I'd been hearing this one particular cat, I thought, for several days, and it always sounded like it was coming from the car park. I know we, as humans, tend to anthropomorphize these things, but it was a sad little cry. After a while, I started to think that maybe this was a pet that was lost or hurt, Maybe it had been beaten up by one of the big strays in the area. The old heartstrings started to pull every time I heard it, but I couldn't spot the little guy anywhere. I thought about trying to put out some tin fish or something, but there are so many other cats that I had no guarantee that this one would benefit from it. The next time I heard it, I decided to go take a more thorough look. It was about 10pm and it was freezing cold but out I went into the car park, looking around the bins and checking under cars. The cat stopped crying as soon as I opened the door, but I guess it must have heard a person and clammed up out of fear. I got about halfway across the space, when a street light, right at the center of the cul-de-sac, the only one that lights up the space, went out. Now, that's pretty weird. The street light isn't motion activated or anything. It's time to come on at night and turn off during the day. It stays on all night. I've never seen it randomly turn off before. Alright, weird electrical fault. I turn back to my apartment. Fortunately, the motion activated light above my door that turned on when I stepped out is still aglow so it's not like I've been plunged into total darkness. Except that one turns off too, pretty much as soon as I turn around. Heh, <laughs> what a coincidence of timing, I say to myself, trying to ignore the growing sense of unease. What do I have to be nervous of? I'm standing in a car park in a cul-de-sac, 
Not the middle of the woods or something, but it's surprisingly dark out there without those lights. Fine. I'll just trigger my light again by moving around, and the damn thing wakes me up all the time because it's too sensitive. It picks up cars and people as soon as they enter the cul-de-sac, except now it's not working. I wave my arms, move closer, nothing triggers it two weird electrical faults in a row. Not impossible, right? But I can't help but feel creeped out by it. Now the cat, that's been silent since I stepped outside, starts crying again. Except it's not just one cat. The crying is coming from several places at once, and started almost at the same time. There've got to be at least three or four different cats, screaming loud from different parts of the car park. I can't see any of them. It's just their weird alien voices. Enough is enough. I go back into my apartment. I'm not going out to investigate if I hear it again. It's not a paranormal event for sure, just a series of creepy coincidences. But still, it weirded me out. Last year, I was going out for drinks with my friends, but since I had to go to uni the next day, I only stayed till around midnight. My boyfriend promised to pick me up and go home with me, because I don't like to take the subway alone at night. But since I was pretty drunk by then, I took a little too long walking out of the pub. Unfortunately, we had to wait for the night bus, since the subway closes on weekdays at night. For context, my boyfriend and I don't live together, but very close to each other. It's around a 15 to 20 minute walking distance between us. Both areas are pretty shitty. He lives near a train station, and I live in a cheap, bad district with a high crime rate. My building has two entrances on two different streets, because it is a corner building site leading to a patio, and then to the apartment building and its doors. I usually use the entrance door that's nearer to the subway, and on my side of the apartment. We had to take two buses to go home. One drove us to the train station, and the next one from the train station to my apartment. After getting off the first bus, we realized we would have to wait for around 20 minutes or something for the second bus to come, and since I really had to sleep at home, I didn't want to stay at his place. My boyfriend didn't want to wait, so he persuaded me to walk instead of taking the bus which sober me would have never done. But since I was still drunk, I didn't care how we got home, so I agreed. So, we started to walk home and passed a few sketchy people, but nothing really bad. Then I saw a guy walking in our direction, and I somehow got a bad feeling. So I told my boyfriend that I wanted to change to the other side of the street because I didn't want to pass him. Suddenly the guy yelled, Hey, as if he wanted to ask us something, but we ignored it and continued to walk. He got louder and louder until he started to yell. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was coming over, so I whispered, Run, to my boyfriend. I took his hand and ran the fastest I could while he was chasing us. We ran and ran and ran, and then made a turn to the right and hid. It seemed like he was gone, so I took out my keys and we started running towards my building, taking the other entrance of my building that I normally didn't use. As I was trying to open the door, my boyfriend started to panic, throwing me inside the patio and closing the door aggressively and then pushing me to the building. He explained that the guy came running from the other side of the street, meaning he took a shortcut probably thinking we were going to run to the subway or bus stop. If we'd taken the other entrance, he would have been clearly the faster one. Being in shock, we unfortunately did not call the police, which I regret. I stopped going out for drinks and clubbing for half a year after this, and I slept at my boyfriend's place for two weeks because I was scared that he would come back. I think the worst thing about this is that he really wanted to get us for whatever reason. 
I still don't know why he chased us for so long. Two weeks later, a girl a few streets away was assaulted in front of her building by a guy who chased her home. I wonder if it was the same guy or just a coincidence. This happened to me eight years ago. It was my first month on the job and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. For the record, I still work there and have more strange stories possibly to tell in the future. I'm a 38-year-old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life and the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well-known concert venues for years, so... I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. In other words, I don't scare easily and hardly ever go into panic mode when a crisis comes up. The place I currently work at is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartment with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in back, indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers and real estate agents, and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It's located in a well-known tourist town in the U.S. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor, the doors are locked at 11 p.m. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in, or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you're at. It will ring the company's cell phone, and I answer and come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on the first floor, are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a coat to get in. This was midsummer and while it's not really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I'm the only security person here at night. My co-worker, who is leaving, told me the side iron gates that lead to the parking lot are open on one side, because they're stuck. This is nothing new, they do often get jammed. She told me the repair would be tomorrow sometime to fix them, but to just do some extra patrol out there that night. This place sits across the road from a public park, and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to breed druggies and homeless at night, who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys, and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm, nor can we detain anyone. We're simply eyes and ears, and to call the police if something comes up. Of course you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases, if you're in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I'm to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious, watch the cameras in the security office, which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for day shift. Or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was really quiet and it rolled around to 3 a.m., I had just sat down to eat my lunch when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, Thanks for calling Bluestone. This is Security Officer James. 
How can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of arm reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked, how can I help you? The man started to breathe heavier and laugh, and in silence. It was one of those laughs you hear in a movie where the lunatic is about to do something terrible. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office and to the door he was at when it rang again, this time from call box number two, which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you and you're gonna die. The voice said in a raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. The phone rang again. This time I picked it up, and before he could speak, I let him know that the cops were on their way, and to leave the property now as he's on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. This guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box as they're a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you. Are you ready to die? The cops won't make it here in time, the guy said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police, but honestly, the location of this place, it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here, and I figured this guy was just some tweaker from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked to the back lot, just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. About a half hour passed. I had finished lunch and just was about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time, it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked it up and said my normal line. Where are the cops? I don't see them. But I see you, the voice said. Fuck, it was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and didn't see anything. I went to the front door to look out, and there was nothing but darkness and a few floodlights on. I know you're alone, and you're going to die soon, he said. I basically told him to get fucked and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. Next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40, with long stringy hair poking down and these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest damn butcher knife I've ever seen and made a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy and probably on drugs. He continued slamming his body against the glass, trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window, but managed to bust his head open, so the window now has blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. 
I then decided to wait for the cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him. And the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones, which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on meth or something, because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores, but this is the last thing I need with this nut job running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass, over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones. He would at least be trapped or it would slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave, and yelled the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl, and then held up that knife again before running into the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly, and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang, and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't. And while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time, his hood had fallen back. He was bald-headed, with wild, long, stringy and crazy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge, and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, Die. Die. While making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later, the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looked like, and I told him I had camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone, and he'd driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy, and that he would patrol the area and to call back if the guy came again. It was now nearly 5 a.m. when the cop left. I waited until 6 a.m. when it was broad daylight and people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. The guy literally took all 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8 a.m., I told her what happened, and she said they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone who worked here know when to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after, but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or found out who he was. This happened to me when I was 19, which would have been in 2003. I was born and raised in a small town, and I was pretty sheltered throughout my childhood and teenage years. I was always warned about stranger danger, but had never really been in a bad situation before. That is, until this happened. After high school, my best friend Jennifer moved to LA to attend USC. I would say that at this point in my life, 
I'd never even been to a truly large city before, so when I went to visit her, it was a bit of a culture shock for me, especially things like the subway, bus, and train systems. Everyone seemed to know exactly where they were going, with no help from anyone, and it was overwhelming me. Luckily, I made it to her dorm okay from the airport. I stayed for a week or so, and we had a great visit. Jennifer and I were always together, which made navigating public transit fairly easy and comfortable. However, on the day I was headed back to the airport, she had work. I didn't want her to worry, and I felt fairly comfortable after riding the bus and subway throughout the week. I said my goodbyes and managed to get on the train to the airport. The first stretch of my trip to the airport went fine. I think I'd even printed off directions. In case you've never used the LA train system, it travels through a lot of smaller neighborhoods before it hits more recognizable, typical, this way to the airport signs. At some point, I became convinced that I was going the wrong way, that I had no idea where I was, that I was going to miss my plane. Panicking, basically. I got off at the next stop and found the map of transit lines, studying them like they were written in Greek. That's when he came up to me. Now when I think about what he looked like, it's a blur. He was big, that I remember, and had a hundred pounds on me easy. But he was a security guard, and he was very friendly, asking me if I needed help. He seemed to genuinely want to help me, and so when he asked if I wanted a ride to the airport, which was very close, he told me, I accepted, grateful to get where I was going. For me at the time, security guard was as good as a cop. I know now that is not the case, but I implicitly trusted him because of his badge and uniform. The first odd feeling I had was the way he threw my suitcase into his trunk, just tossing it in and slamming the trunk. Then, I got into his car. It was filthy, with cigarette butts and trash strewn throughout. I remember not knowing where to put my feet and had to put them on top of piles of garbage. Still, he had a picture of a little kid dangling from his rearview mirror, and so I thought, okay, it's not a big deal, he's a good person. We start driving, and I have absolutely no idea where he's going, but of course I wouldn't. However, after a while, it's clear he's not going to the airport, or at least not the direct route. I try and stay calm and ask him questions. He asserts that he knows where he's going, that this is the fastest, secret way, stuff like that. We end up in a pretty abandoned business area, a place for freight and other businesses that were either closed or empty. There wasn't a soul in sight, just deserted stretches of road. He begins circling the same streets, retracing where he's already been. At this point, I'm freaking out, but I don't want him to know how scared I am. It's here that I feel like I wake up to the bad position I'm in. He had these reflective sunglasses on and was smoking cigarette after cigarette. After a while of me asking where we were and where we were going, he stops talking altogether refusing to answer me. After a long period of driving in silence, he starts to ask me about my underwear, how long I'd been wearing it, what color it was. At first I played along, trying to be cool, I guess. I made up the color they were, saying that my boyfriend wouldn't like the conversation, stuff like that. I tried to placate him, not wanting to make him angry, then he told me he would give me a hundred dollars just to see my underwear, and he began to reach over and tried to touch me, my knee and thigh. I just told him no, not interested, and he did not stop trying. And at this point, I am fully aware of the danger I'm in. The only thing I wanted was to be able to get out of the car. I began to think of how bad it would hurt with how fast we were going. I began to tell him that if he just wants to drop me off, I can have someone come get me. 
I remember trying to make him think that none of this was a big deal, that he could just leave me and that I would be fine. I just wanted to leave the car. I kept trying to remind him that I had a plane to catch, that I was worried I wouldn't make it. Though I imagined that I sounded calm, I know that, in my fear, I was shakily saying everything. It's hard to remember how long we drove around in what felt like the middle of nowhere. I was leaning far into my side of the passenger seat, thinking that I would just have to jump out if it got bad enough. And then, after a final refusal to let him see, touch, or smell my underwear for money, he speeds up and leaves the area we were driving around in. He drives me to the closest train station, quickly, and pulls into the parking lot. Needless to say, I've never been so happy to see a train station. I quickly get out of the car and make sure people can see me. I can remember thinking that was important. He gets out, pulls my luggage out of his trunk, throws it out onto the ground, calls me a bitch and speeds off. I did get to the airport and make my flight. I didn't tell anyone this story for a long time because I felt so stupid that I'd put myself into this now so obviously dangerous situation. I still feel this way. But now I worry that I should have told someone that maybe he did this to someone else who didn't get so lucky. I work at a jewelry store in a small mall somewhere remote in Canada. It's a fun job. I love my co-workers, love the customers and love the fixed schedule working in a mall gives me. It's nice to know I'll be off by 6pm every night. Gives me plenty of time to socialize and study outside of work. The mall is a single loop with probably around 50 stores operating on average. They employ a staff of about 30 people to keep the mall operating. Half of this staff works admin, the other 15 or so work security. As a regular 40-hour-a-week employee, I've had my fair share of interactions with security. Having them escort me to the bus stop, on the occasional night inventory had me working late, or calling them into the store to help me deal with an irate customer. Over the years, I became acquainted with a few of the security guards. My favorites were Will, April, and Mark. Will was the friendliest. He'll pop his head into my store and say good morning to me when I'm opening. April was the most, by the books, security guard. She usually helped me deal with difficult customers. Mark was one of the evening security guards, so my only interactions with him were escorts late at night to the bus, during which he was quiet but polite. A schedule shuffle last year put Will on parking lot patrols, April mostly on evening shifts and put Mark on day duty. Not the end of the world, just kind of sucked no longer having a friendly conversation with Will as I opened the store, and not having badass April around to step in when customers get unruly. Mark was a lot more quiet than his two counterparts, and just wasn't quite as friendly. I didn't interact with him much for the first few months after this new schedule started. I'd give him a smile as he walked by my store, and it helped him out a few times with shoplifters. But beyond that, nada. No great friendship blossoming out of the schedule rotation or anything. About two months after the schedule had changed, I had my first bad encounter with Mark. I was walking through one of the mall staff hallways to take a washroom break. Mark happened to be walking just ahead of me, also going to the washroom. When we reached the doors, he looked me up and down, and then remarked, This is gonna be hard. I got a bit of a chill when he said that, but assumed there was an issue in the men's washroom. Someone passed out in a stall or something, so I asked him, Oh no, why? Because I'm nosy, and was excited to have a bit of mall gossip to share with my co-workers. He got a cold, distant look in his eyes, and said, My doctor advised against heavy lifting and then he winked at me. 
I ran into the girls' washroom and texted my manager, freaking out about what he just said, knowing full well what he implied with that remark. Mark is a 45-year-old man with graying hair and a bit of a beer gut. He stands around 6 foot 2. I'm a tiny 5 foot 7 girl who was about 20 at the time of this. It creeped me out so much that I reported it to April, my next shift, who promised me she would handle it. I stopped seeing Mark doing patrols and assumed he'd been switched back off of day shift. For about two weeks, I'd heard nothing from him or any of the other security guards. I was just about to end my shift one evening with about 15 minutes left before we closed for the day. I hear someone enter my store and look up to see Mark walking towards me with just a look of pure hate on his face. I wasn't working alone, so I stepped into the back room to avoid dealing with him. It didn't work. Mark threw the door to my back room open and stood there, screaming his lungs out at me. How it was my fault he'd lost his job how I'd ruined his life, and how I was going to pay for my mistake. He viewed the sexual comment he made as a joke, and thought I was a bitch straight from hell for reporting him. He screamed for a few minutes, and the second he paused for breath, I calmly told him to get out of my store because I was calling the cops and security. He ran out of the store, and a moment later Will sprinted in. He just screamed at me, Where the fuck did he go? and I pointed as I started to cry. I was shaking from the confrontation as I gave my statements to the police and mall security. Mark had been fired after my report, but security was adamant that it wasn't my fault. Mark had racked up a bunch of complaints over his years, and it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. He was banned from mall premises the day he got fired and criminally trespassed when he came in to scream at me. Authorities issued a warrant for him, and it took weeks for him to reappear and be arrested. During those weeks, I was very scared. Mark knew what bus I take. Mark knew my work schedule. Mark hated me. Every time I turned a corner, I was scared he'd be there. I believe he's out of jail now. This happened to me a few years ago while traveling. I was private tutoring, and my boss sent me to his office to pick up my paycheck at the end of the first month. He gave me the address, so me and my boyfriend at the time drove there, and he waited outside for me. It was a tall building, and I approached what looked like a security guard. I showed him the address I had written down to make sure it was the right place. He studied it, nodded, and told me it was on the fifth floor, and he showed me the direction to the elevator. As I got in the elevator, he stepped in with me. He pressed number five. I assumed it was his job to escort people to the right floors. He was staring me up and down the entire time. I glanced down at the address my boss had written down and realized it said, second floor, not fifth. I turned to the security guard and I started to say, I think we're a little confused as this says second. He made out he didn't understand my language, so I started to repeat the number two in Vietnamese instead. He completely ignored me and instead turned and gave me this creepy smile. It still sent shivers down my spine when I think about it. He reached out and started to stroke my hair saying, so beautiful. I froze to the spot and started to shout, no, at him over and over. By this point, the doors to the elevator had opened. I stepped out and looked around, and there was absolutely nothing there. It was under construction. There was paint and dirty old sheets everywhere, all over the floor. I ran towards the window and looked outside, to see if I could get my boyfriend's attention, but I was too high up. The creepy guy had gotten out too and was pointing me down an empty corridor. He looked really frustrated now, 
He was blocking the elevator by this point, so I couldn't get back in. I pretended to walk towards the corridor, and he followed me. When I got to the door, I bolted back to the elevator and started to press the button to the ground floor, and he followed me. Whenever the doors closed, he would just press the button from the other side, and they'd open again. He was shouting at me in Vietnamese and looked angry with me. Adrenaline had kicked in, and I was literally thinking about anything I could use or how I could defend myself if he tried anything with me. I started screaming as loud as I possibly could to make him back off. As I pressed the ground floor button and the doors began to close again, he smiled at me once more. This awful, creepy smile that I think about all the time. My heart was in my mouth as I imagined what would be waiting for me when the doors inevitably opened again. To my surprise, the elevator started moving towards the ground floor this time, and I managed to get out. I ran out as fast as possible and was crying by the time I got to my boyfriend. He wanted to go back inside, but I stopped him and made him drive me home. Fast. The same day, I called my boss and explained what had happened. It turns out, I wasn't even in the right building, never mind the right floor. I blame myself for getting the wrong address, but a different country in that. I don't know why the guy in there pretended I was in the right location, or what his intentions were with me, or even why he decided to just let me go. Maybe he was trying to scare me, or maybe he was trying his luck with me. I have no idea but I think about it from time to time or tell the story again to someone. And it really creeps me out to think of what could have been. I've never gotten in an elevator with a man again either. I'm a male security officer. I found a strange letter on patrol. For context, it's been raining in my area for the past couple of days. While on patrol, I found a letter. Despite the weather conditions, the letter, although soaked, is 100% legible. The letter contained this message. Mr. E, I don't know what's going on with me. The minute I get back to camp, I get uncomfortable around you. I straight up go into not able to shut up defense mode. The more it happens, the snarkier the comments become. I go on edge and stay that way until I go to sleep. So I leave and stay gone till the sun comes up. It seems that for some reason, I do not trust you when we're alone in the dark. I'm not sure why, but something has changed. Something feels wrong. And you don't seem to care all that much if I'm around or not just as long as you have a place to stay until you get your camper. What I want to know is, what is it that needed to be done? The area I patrol is fenced in. There hasn't been anyone here except me. The ink is still legible. The paper is lightly worn, despite the weather. There's no camp within an hour's range of here. Who is Mr. E? Mystery. I don't know how this letter came here, but I don't want to meet you. So the other night, I was working this post that was pretty much shut down with roadblocks up to check any and all personnel that do try to enter the facility. Both roads that lead to my gate were blocked off less than half a mile just north of me, and another a little over two miles to my southwest, around a bend that was completely out of sight. Well, the one just north of me, when people do pull up to it late at night, the headlights will just be visible down by me on my cameras. I was sitting there drinking some coffee and trying to keep myself awake. I'd hardly seen anybody. My sight was inactive due to what we call a hard down, with only essential personnel being granted entry. 
A truck had just come pulling up to the guard shack just north of me as I watched on camera. And as the truck is pulling up and coming to a stop, I see a reflection in the camera that I thought was just the lights of the truck. Until I opened my eyes a bit wider to focus, I saw it move. What it looked like was a complete silhouette of a person, and I thought maybe somebody was walking up to my gate in the dark, and it made me jump out of my seat to look out the front window to confirm a visual. As I'm looking out, I see absolutely nothing, and I look back to the monitor, and there it is on screen. The silhouette of a man that looks to be wearing a hazmat suit. I kept looking back and forth from the window to the camera, and as I'm doing this in live time, I'm just catching glimpses of what the camera is picking up. I radio the other two guards, asking if they'd let any personnel get through their checkpoints. I get a negative response back, asking me what's up. I told them to stand by as I review what I just saw on the recordings. To my absolute disbelief, I watched, stunned. As the truck comes pulling to the north guard shack, its lights shine on some movement. What I could make out was a silhouette figure of a man wearing a hazmat suit walking. When the truck comes to a stop, the man also stops. The man looks towards the truck, does a double take from me to the truck, and just walks across the road and disappears. I thought I was going crazy and maybe seeing things because of my lack of sleep. I clipped and saved that portion of the video and waited till shift change to show the other guards I worked with over the night and the ones coming to relieve us. I never said anything about that night or anything to the guards coming on shift and I played the clip for them. Everybody's jaw dropped and saw exactly what I did without me pointing anything out. This is a regular occurrence. Out here, most of the guards that have been here a while have seen things and have stories. I just got what I've been waiting for. Solid proof for myself. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to my channel members and patrons. Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.